Good morning, everybody. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where yeah. you are. We are and you and you. <laughs> happy World Narcolepsy Day, everybody. Yay. Happy World Narcolepsy Day. That's probably more appropriate than, uh, than morning, good evening, good afternoon. <laughs> good to see you, Julie. Good to see you. Um, just quickly before we get started, just want to um, say we have this amazing panel here of people from around the world um, sharing their stories and we're so grateful to them. For some people, English is not their first language and we're really grateful for their willingness and their bravery to come on here and, and to share their story about narcolepsy and in English <laughs> for our audience. And um, just want to quickly say for those tuning in, uh, please comment, please share this video to help us raise awareness and please um, share where you are viewing from. We'd love to see where everybody is tuning in and watching us uh, today from. Uh, it's pretty surreal that this is our third annual World Narcolepsy Day. And so as you do, um, you know, comment on the video via Facebook, please remember that the comments do stay public with the video and this will be recorded. So you don't wanna share anything there that you wouldn't wanna share otherwise publicly. And just one last quick reminder is if anything about anyone's stories today um, spark questions for you about your own medical situation, um, please bring those questions to a medical expert or your sleep specialist um, and get more answers that way. We do these uh, education and videos for education and awareness purposes. So, but we are not doctors ourselves, although we do have a doctor here on our panel, but still make sure you're bringing your questions about your health to your doctor. That's always very important. Uh, so without further ado, um, just quickly before we uh, go into hearing people's stories, I just want to uh, quickly say hi to everyone around the world. So we have Brad in Australia, our Dr. Brad McKay. Hi, Brad. Hi, hi everyone. Hi. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from Sydney. We're in lockdown at the moment, so I can't go five kilometers from my house. So uh, that's where we're at at the moment with COVID. Fun, fun times. <laughs> fun times. So we've trapped you at home. Uh, and, and no choice. Got you yes. Uh, we have David in China. Hi, David. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us uh, from China, David, and really excited because Narcolepsy China is a nonprofit organization in China that has reach, recently reached out and been part of our coalition. So it's a new organization that joined our coalition uh, leading World Narcolepsy Day. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, and we have Antia here in Germany. Hi, Antia. Hi. Glad to, glad to be here today. There's a little background noise. Uh, let's see. Uh, and we have um, Agata in Poland. Hey, Agata. Hi, everyone. Hello from Europe. <laughs> it's afternoon there, right? Yes. <laughs> Middle of the day. Middle of the day. Awesome. And we have Iris in Angola. Hi, Iris. And will you share where people with people where Angola is in case they don't know? Yes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so in case nobody's ever heard of it, Angola is in southwest of Africa. So obviously everybody knows South Africa. That's the best reference. We're four hours from there, basically. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. And we have Juliana in Brazil. Hey, Juliana. Hi. Happy Narcolepsy Day. <laughs> Thank you. And where are you in Brazil? I'm in Salvador. Bye. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, well, and um, we, we should also have uh, Joaquin from Uruguay, um, but I think he, we'll see if he can join us again. <laughs> he was here and then he, you know, how the internet works. Technology. It's great until it doesn't work. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started with uh, Dr. Brad McKay. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit about your experience uh, in Australia with uh, your symptoms developing first? Um, how long did it take to get diagnosed? Um, what were the symptoms that were bothering you? Uh, yeah, let's start there. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, hi, I'm Brad. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a GP, a family doctor in Sydney, Australia at the moment. Uh, and yeah, like I 
going back to uh, to when I started getting narcolepsy symptoms would have been when I was about 19. Um, I just started feeling really tired um, and was trying to do hospital rounds, um, just getting exhausted by the end of the day, uh, having to uh, like try to make my way down the staircase of the hospital without tripping uh, and then would get into my car and have a bit of a nap before I would drive home and then have another nap and then have dinner and then try to study and then fall asleep studying and then have another sleep. Um, so I was, I went and saw the GP um, for quite a few times and they sort of said, oh, well, we don't really know what's going wrong. Um, your blood tests are all fine. Maybe you've had glandular fever at some stage and maybe that's, maybe you've just got this post viral fatigue. Um, and so I sort of like went along with that diagnosis for a while. And then about six months later, I was still feeling tired. Um, then um, yeah, they said, well, maybe, maybe you've got chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so I started seeing an exercise physiologist and trying to um, train myself back into health, but I didn't really fit the criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so I felt like I was, yeah, just going around in circles with this strange treatment criteria that probably doesn't work for chronic fatigue syndrome anyway, uh, but that's another story. Uh, and then um, what uh, I, I ended up um, sort of like trying to like cross things off the list. So I sort of went, oh, well, am I depressed? Um, yeah, okay, well, let's go and get some treatment for that. And so I got lots of counseling and so I wasn't depressed anymore and wasn't really anxious, um, but I was still really tired. Um, and then I ended up seeing a sleep physician who did an overnight sleep study and then said, oh, maybe you've got like obstructive sleep apnea, um, even though your sleep study doesn't really show this. Um, and then maybe you should try a mandibular advancement splint to try to keep your airway open at nighttime. Um, and then I tried that for about six months and that didn't really improve anything. I still felt tired all the time. Um, and then eventually saw like a chronic fatigue specialist, which is a, a weird sort of like um, physician. Uh, they're very, very rare in Australia anyway. Uh, and then he wanted me to see a different sleep physician because he didn't trust the last sleep physician's um, uh, advice. Um, then I went and saw um, a different sleep physician and then had a um, MSLT, so mean sleep latency test. Uh, and then, yeah, just found that I was falling asleep within about four minutes um, every, every time I was sort of like having the, the lights turned off um, during the day. So it, was, it wasn't until like that was like a 10 year period of time of just trying to find a diagnosis and, and trying different treatment measures uh, and not really getting anywhere at all. And, and, and this was really weird because I was like going through medical school, then qualified as a doctor and I was working as an intern, then as a resident and, and all this time like we weren't really taught much about sleep medicine at all. So um, our, our teaching on narcolepsy was pretty much zero for the for the whole uh, for my whole medical career, um, even going into general practice training and, and becoming a family doctor, like we still don't have much. Like we're taught about obstructive sleep apnea and we're taught about CPAP machines and how you need to really be diagnosing that because it's a major risk for hypertension and, and heart disease. Um, and, and it just sort of like skimmed over like all the other sleep disorders that there are. Um, so it wasn't until I sort of started getting an education from a sleep physician who knew what the hell they were talking about. Um, and then I, I started sort of like entering into this whole world that really wasn't discussed. Uh, and even, even with my own patients now, I find it's quite difficult to try to get a diagnosis because you've got to find a, like a sleep physician who's educated within like a sleep framework because often they are sort of like trained as anaesthetists or in respiratory medicine. And then they're really focusing on airways and breathing. And they're not really focusing on hypocretin and, and other sort of hormonal um, responses that can go on or idiopathic hypersomnia. So it's, it's really like a it, like it seems like a niche area but if it's one in two thousand people you sort of think it's not really that niche maybe just missing a whole lot of diagnoses um and yeah that's this is why it's really important to talk about it as we are today um because yeah it, it's really difficult um down under to uh to get a diagnosis wow so it's, that's my it's short story <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable to even think that like you as a doctor now, a primary care doctor that's obviously passionate about, <laughs> you know, probably, I don't know if you, <laughs> I would think that you'd be extra passionate about helping people that might have a sleep disorder get help. And even that's hard. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because if, if somebody comes in saying that they're tired, like being tired can be, there's a whole range of different reasons that can make somebody tired. And then like sleepy is sort of a bit of a subsection of that. And you don't really have many people coming in saying I'm feeling sleepy all the time, um, which is sort of yeah, a bit of a differential. Um, but even if you're sending somebody to a sleep physician, a sleep specialist, then yeah, you it's a little bit hit and miss. If you don't know, um, like if you're not in the know of who is trained in what regard like you just consider them all the same and so you could be sending your your patients to somebody who really doesn't know all that much about narcolepsy it's not on their radar and they'll just say oh yep you're you do or don't have obstructive sleep apnea and then that's sort of the end of the conversation so it's yeah it's a it's a weird weird um, measure and how is treatment in australia um, so treatment is interesting. Uh, so at the moment uh, in Australia, like the, the, main, the main treatments are stimulant medication. So um, if somebody's diagnosed, then um, we're treated with um, modafinil, armodafinil, or dexamphetamine. Those are sort of like the main uh, medications that, that we use. Um, uh, over, in, over in America, I, I understand uh, that, uh, that a, the first line treatment would be something like Xyron. So you're using like sodium oxabate to help your sleep time. So you're getting better sleep. So then during the daytime, you're actually functioning more like a human being. Uh, so at the moment is, in Australia, they're trying to sort of get a, across the line. They're trying to sort of bring um, a, a, like different drugs into, uh, into um, government funding and uh, make them more freely available um, but there, there's a lot of roadblocks at the moment so the TGA the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia basically says oh well narcolepsy is a sleepiness problem so you need to be using stimulant medication they don't really see that not getting appropriate deep sleep is really the the issue <laughs> that's well part of the issue that's behind it so their the focus is completely different and even the, the language that they use um they, they obviously don't really realize what narcolepsy is as part of their their framework of of understanding what what the disease process is so um i think one of the documents also talk instead of talking about cat cataplexy they're talking about catalepsy so um so they don't even know what <laughs> like how to spell the word um <laughs> let alone um what it means so, so uh, yeah, so we, we don't have those medications. Uh, I think a lot of patients are, are put on tricyclic antidepressants or, or different antidepressants to sort of like knock out their, their dream life. So, so that's what I sort of have at nighttime. So I'm not getting petrified um, every night when I sh shut my eyes and, and, uh, and have movie length dreams that I'm uh, struggling to, uh, to fight my way through uh, and survive every evening like I did previously. Um, so I'm quite happy with, uh, without a, a dream life at the, at the moment, um, but it, it's still not brilliant. And there's lots of side effects as well that you can get from other medications. So um, yeah, it's sort of like, it seems like we're treating half of the disorder in Australia and we're just forgetting everything that's happening at night. Wow. That's really frustrating. <laughs> and, and you just, it's, you, it's weird. You can because, get it, yeah. but it's extremely expensive and you've got to order it in. And then we have like drug shortage problems as well. So it's, there's not, there's a very poor distribution as well for, for medications like sodium oxabate. Yeah. And quickly just want to give a shout out to both Brad and I think Narcolepsy Australia, the organization um, has been advocating for years um, on this issue and, and also one of the biggest proponents of World Narcolepsy Day. And so I'm really grateful to our um, friends in Australia for being so supportive of this event and active in trying to make change. Um, and I hope that they continue to make more change. <laughs> um, so really quick, Lauren, can I check in with you and see if you had an update um, on you know, where people are tuning in from? Uh, yeah, we have so many folks tuning in from all over the world, all over the US, um, Tokyo, Canada, Czech Republic, Australia, and Scotland are the folks who've chimed in with where they're from so far. Um, and the folks from Australia are, are echoing that uh, everything that Brad just said. So. Yeah, it sounds like a frustrating situation over there. Thank you, Lauren. All right, oops, we got a little bit of feedback here. Um, David, I would love to, uh, let's see if we can get you on here. There we go. David, hello, we are so excited you're joining us from China. So can you share a little bit about your experience um, with yeah. symptoms of Yeah, I'm happy, I'm happy for 
people can join this this meeting, but maybe my English speaking is not not very fluently. <laughs> so just uh, just listen. If you can't understand, you can can tell me, and I will um, just uh, to explain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm David. Nice to meet you, <laughs> everybody. Uh, I'm from China. Um, maybe I just uh, uh, when I um, diagnosis before my before my diagnosis, maybe I used to sleep in my school class. <laughs> maybe class um, license, especially when the class license is very boring. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just uh, I just uh, feel felt asleep in the license, and uh, uh, when I started to my to do my homework, maybe after dinner, uh, I feel I felt very sleepy. I just want to <laughs> I just very sleepy when I was a boy. And uh, this period, uh, this period, maybe four or three years um, before my um, went to the hospital, and uh, in the summer of two thousand and seven, I went to the hospital. Uh, I went to uh, Peking Union Medical College Hospital. This, this hospital is maybe one of the best hospitals in, in China. Uh, so uh, after medical, uh, medical examination, um, I maybe sleep, slept four, four or five times in the hospital. Um, uh, every time maybe half an hour. Uh, every time I I fall I fall in, fall into sleep, and um, so um, so I was diagnosed. Uh, my sleep latency was very short, maybe just uh, one minute to two minutes, uh, less than five minutes. So. Um, and uh, when my family and I got, got to the result, uh, I, I felt very, very sad, very, very sad, because the teacher, the doctor told me, maybe you, maybe you can't reco recover from this illness. Maybe in your lifetime, you are like, you are like this. Uh, and uh, and I was very sad. That was in the summer of two thousand and seven, um, and we bought some medicine from the hospital. <laughs> the name of the medicine was MPH. <laughs> this English, this English word is so hard for me. <laughs> so I choose the shortened form, <laughs> MPH. Okay. Uh, when I faced the uh, to important examinations, I would take a pill. I just, um, because after having pills, I had a head, uh, heavy headache. Mm, yeah. So I take medicine very carefully. Um, just uh, just uh, when I felt uh, important examinations. Back to my school, my parents don't want me to tell the truth to the teachers and the classmates because they worried about uh, worried about me. Maybe they think they thought um, my classmates or my or my friends would give me <laughs> nicknames. Uh, I had um, I had many nicknames in my school. Um, for example, sleep man, uh, sleepy guard, <laughs> they sing. Uh, okay. 
And uh, in my family, my parents loved me, but they don't know how to face how to face this um, this this illness. They don't know how to talk with me, so we don't talk this topic in my family. <laughs> Uh, and I feel much pressure. I, feel mu I felt much pressure in my family. But, uh, and in my high school, my grades dropped very quickly because I can't learn mathematics very well. Because when I learn mathematics, I felt very sleepy and tired. It's really hard for me. <laughs> and. Uh, both my both my body and my heart were ill. Mm, I got angry easily. It makes it makes especially when I woke up on my desk. Uh, it's hard. It's it's really hard. I I think God is unfair. Is unfair to me. I complain so much. To be thankful, I went to a not by university. And uh, in my university time, I met some kind of people and friends. They let me know the gospel. And uh, they were full of love. When I, when I met my friends, I can tell the truth to my friends. It's really, it's really a happy thing for me. I can tell my secret to the people, to the person who loved me. And, uh, I, and uh, when I go to church, and when I went to church, I felt peaceful in church. I was attracted by the love of Jesus and uh, my heart became open to others. I can, I can make friends. I, I didn't get angry easily and I uh, became real to other people. And my heart felt more peaceful. My bad dreams became fewer and fewer. When I was in my high, high school, Every day I had many, many bad dreams. Maybe in the movie, you can't imagine it. Yeah. And though I'm still, now I'm still a patient, but I know my life are full of colorful dreams, not bad dreams. And I have hope. And uh, and but in my when I went to the hospital, I saw many boys and girls so young they sl slept on the lap of their parents. I felt so depressed. I I wish they they can they can be loved because they are not as energetic as other children, but I wish, well, I wish they can. I wish they can when they are not sleepy, they are happy. When they are not, when they are not tired, they can play games, they can play basketball, they can play football. Maybe they can run at, run as a player. Okay. Um, I hope they can be cared by the group in the family and the school. Uh, and uh, um, later, um, recently, I joined this group of uh, organization. Uh, I felt very grateful. Um, they can, I can communicate with my my friend, my friends, and uh, I can give my suggestions, and uh, I can tell 
tell my stories and the others can tell their stories, we can feel the we can feel the friendship and uh, have a po positive attitude towards life. Yeah. Yes, we're so grateful, David. David, we were diagnosed in the same year, 2007. Yeah. So we were diagnosed <laughs> the same year, 14 years ago. That's so yeah, long sir. ago. Yes. Yeah, so long time. So long time we're ago. We're so grateful for you for sharing. So honestly, big hearts. I love these hearts. Um, Thank you. And, Thanks you for yes. your patience. Oh, it's it's a it's such an honor to hear your experience. Um, and thank you for being vulnerable and open to sharing. <laughs> um, so I, I think we will um, try to move along from Asia now to Europe um, and hear some stories from Europe. So Antia, uh, please uh, join us from Germany here to uh, share a little bit about your experience. Hi, well, I'm very pleased to be here with you guys and um, been very moved by David's story. Um, yeah. Uh, I, um, my, my symptoms before diagnosis were actually, yeah, excessive sleepiness. And then I thought, well, I just need to sleep for a couple of weeks, like really much, like go, coming home from school, sleeping, eating, going back to bed. But as everybody knows, it doesn't help. It, the opposite is happening. Actually, your system is going down because yeah, if you don't move and only, uh, only in bed, it's not very helpful. And actually then the, what was the toughest for me was the dreams. I had terrible dreams and uh, problems with sleep paralysis and uh, took me a while to really uh, find out that it was sleep paralysis and not just an intensive dreaming. And uh, when I figured out that it was happening, that I was lying on my desk uh, among other pupils and I could actually listen to what they say and then afterwards I would ask them did you talk about this or did you say this and then they were like yes that will but you were sleeping weren't you and I was like well I don't know <laughs> and that was really very that was actually uh, increasing the dreams uh, the, the the nightmares because I was actually thinking that I had some uh, that I must be going crazy or something <laughs> and um, but uh, luckily and this is actually super extraordinary is that I got my diagnosis in 1992 within a year <laughs> yes I mean that's not the the typical case I know so I'm very grateful for that because even one year uh, feeling how I felt and noticing all these strange things like uh, strange appearances in my bedroom and stuff like that was uh, actually already very uh, was affecting me psychologically a lot so how old yeah. were you then how old i was 17. i was 17 when um symptoms started and 18 when i got the diagnosis yeah it's uh it's been uh, i've just been to a neurologist the second one <laughs> And uh, the doctor just had a friend who had narcolepsy. That's actually the. That's actually the reason why. Yeah. So, everybody's impressed. I know. <laughs> yes. But yeah, that's uh, okay. I, it was. Uh, it was a relief at first, of course. But at the same time, as you know, uh, learning that you have a chronic disease that has no. I mean that until now is not curable is also hard so it took me a while to actually find out i had all the symptoms but um my cataplexy is as the same i think with bread is it's a very it's not um the main symptom and i don't usually fall i never hurt myself or i never like i was never like lying there as as i read in your book 
like Julie, as uh, happens with a lot of people have cataplexy as a main symptom or one of the biggest symptoms. Well, we are also different. We have the same disease and we're also different, which is actually one of the main reasons why I think it's so important to, um, to share experiences because uh, we are the experts, <laughs> I think. And we can help yeah. each other. Out, so. Yes, and, the treatment there and the understanding in Germany. I really don't know. Oh, uh, actually, back then, uh, the teachers also. I think what David said, kind of like, it's not the same as in China, but it also some teachers that had then like a certificate and some teachers said I just uh, wanted to make myself uh, more interesting or something <laughs> they didn't believe that they thought like maybe I don't know I was just uh, just bored and just wanted to get like a certificate which excused me from being awake during class or something I don't know but uh, luckily, I was not, uh, the, the other pupils did not um, like mock me or something. So I'm very grateful for that. And even though I sometimes, sometimes you fall up, you, you even hurt your <laughs> head on the table when you start to stay awake, right? And you fight not to fall asleep and then boof, that's kind of embarrassing thing happening, but okay. Yeah, uh, so I think that uh, it was not very, it was very unknown when I had the diagnosis. It was really, uh, it, it really, um, it, it's coming, it's getting, it's getting more, um, not popular. Um, well, a lot of people know more about narcolepsy now. Um, and I am very happy that well, I started out with a help, self-help organization, but um, I want, don't want to talk too long. But I think it was, uh, first I was terrified by all these people falling down with cataplexies. So <laughs> after my first meeting uh, with uh, other youth and young people from Germany, I had to, I, I was actually avoiding meetings for years because it, it uh, frightened me so much because I didn't know that probably I, I just thought I'd be like that too in the future and that uh, I was also already very busy with the symptoms I had uh, so I was it just it still moves me a lot actually when I see it happening so it's really still I'm touched by it but I can now see that more it's a more normal thing now. And uh, then I actually actually led a self-help group for two years in Darmstadt, which was also a very good experience, but also not always very easy. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people think uh, that a self-help organizer has to do everything. And like, it's also, um, it's it would be nicer if it would be like, everybody's participating everybody's contributing thing kind of, but that's another topic not today anyway so yeah i i kind of made my way and i did everything i wanted to do um and i take um modafinil which i think was also one question about uh therapy therapy in germany um but well, germany has i think good medical system and but there's only a few doctors who really know about narcolepsy so my doctor is far away i have to go for three hours by train to see him once a year and then we do um online sessions and he just sent me the prescriptions which is really nice so he's actually one of the doctors who uh proved um, a couple of years ago dr kalweit he, he he was one of the researchers who found out that narcolepsy is an autoimmune illness anyway so i'm i have a good doctor and it's not decreasing it's staying stable so i'm just trying i'm just i'm just coping i think i'm really good now with coping because you know 1992 and today yeah so i i have a lot of coping strategies and uh i i just uh, 
I think it's good to have a disease that's not decreasing. It's decreasing is not the right word. It's um, increasing, actually. Uh, it's getting worse. I mean, something that's degenerated oh. or something. So um, I Thanks. think it's always good to, to look at it from a, the most possible positive point of view. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much uh, for, I think I answered everything and yeah. And you running. mentioned um, you mentioned before we started some kids in the other room, possibly. Are you a mom? Yes, I have two boys. 11, How old are they? 11 and 14. Wow. That's got to keep you busy. Actually, you know, I, I, I managed even to, to have an academic uh, career, stuff like that. But having kids was the most challenging part when they were little. I so I, I really have to say that this is really a long topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yes, a topic you need, for another you need day. A village. You need a village to raise kids as an epileptic, definitely. Yes. <laughs> we'll, have you back. we'll have you back for another broadcast on parenting with narcolepsy, but we just want to give a shout out to all the parents that are out there with narcolepsy because anytime anyone emails me and they're like, oh, I'm a mom with narcolepsy, but I'm not really doing, you know, a hundred other things. And I'm like, but you're a mom. That's amazing. It's a lot of work, I would imagine. So, um, yes. All right. Well, thank you, Antia, so much for joining me. It's so fun to see you again. I got to um, Skype with Antia a few years ago um, about an article for Germany. So I'm really glad that we were able to reconnect and do this. Um, so why don't we, let's see, um, why don't we go to Agata first and, and so we'll stay in Europe for a little bit and then we'll go down to Africa and visit Iris. <laughs> so Agata, cause I'm really excited to have you with us too. Um, Agata is somewhat at a little bit of a different part of her journey and, uh, we've been communicating, um, over the last couple of months and I was really excited for uh, to include Agata, because share Agata, where are you in your journey? Oops, you're on mute though. We got you muted. Okay, yes. Uh, hi everyone, my story is um, quite long story because it took me 12 years to be diagnosed and I'm still waiting. Uh, it's uh, It was really hard for me to Mm, to live my life with narcolepsy and not knowing about it because whole life it was like mm, pretending that I'm not tired. It's, mm, it's ruined my old relationship, all achievements, all dreams. Mm, but now I think it's a huge, mm, I don't know how to say, abyss. It's a difference between people who are diagnosed and not diagnosed. Because when you are diagnosed, you can live. You can be happy because you know why you are tired. And um, without uh, this knowledge, you think, oh my God, I'm, I, am, I am wrong. I'm wrong. I'm not working. I'm, I'm different. I don't know why. And it's, um, I think this is the reason of kind of depression. And uh, if you don't have people who can help you and support uh, it's really hard to function in a normal way uh, my problems uh, and tiredness started in high school then i started visiting doctors and they um, told me that it's a stress it's anemia it's um, kind of uh, um, depression maybe they made me some blood tests and said oh it's okay then i graduate I started my family. I also become a mom and it was really the hardest part of my life to be a young mom and don't know why you are sleeping on the floor. Uh, I was crying. I was asking everyone to help me and they said, okay, I can take a baby for a walk for, for an hour. You can rest. No, I can't rest in an hour. Now I know, but a few years ago, it was really hard to understand me and I was so stupid that when I got this hour, I made laundry, I, I started doing cleaning, nothing goes uh, okay because I have no energy and it was all, all it was going wrong and mm, well, it was worse and worse. Uh, my biggest problem started two years ago. Um, Mm, and then I said, okay, I take control of it. I'm going to all specialist doctors. I told everyone that I'm tired. I'm really tired. I sleep in my car. Please help me make some tests or something. 
I do my test results are this kind of uh, <laughs> fat. Uh, I really uh, do everything I can and all correct. I'm super healthy person. Uh, so they started um, to tell me like, mm, you're um, don't don't be so um, so sick. You are a very um, a good good person. Please, um, it's um, it's only in your mind. Um, sleep well and feel good. Uh, and uh, when la um, last um, uh, uh, six months, it was horrible. I slept eighteen hours per day and couldn't do anything with this. So. Then I thought maybe it's not problem with my tiredness, but maybe it's problem with my sleep. And I don't sleep, uh, I sleep inefficient. And I started looking for a reason. Then I heard about narcolepsy and thanks to Project Sleep and all people you write your stories, share there. Uh, on the once one, there was one girl on YouTube who tell, uh, uh, who tell a story and she used words, I am so tired. And when I heard it, I, I go with this film to my parents. I said, listen to her, listen to her. She's like me. I'm so tired. There's, and doctors ask it, and what you're doing in your free time? Nothing. I'm so tired. And this, your stories, your people who are narcoleptic helped me to understand that this could be a disease. I started to reading about it, but in Polish, uh, it was like, like, mm, Oh, maybe th there is some disease, nothing like this. And <clears throat> I started reading articles, uh, uh, searching for my blood tests, some hormones, uh, and finding this connection. Uh, then I made an appointment um, to a uh, doctors who special specialize in um, sleep medicine, but I had to wait um, six months. I still have got one month to, to this visit. And during this time, I couldn't sit. I was looking for, for my own uh, these symptoms, made MS style test at home with my mom, uh, five uh, naps and uh, watching uh, how fast I uh, uh, fell asleep, um, remembering my dreams um, that I can dream even if a short nap. Uh, my nightmares. I always thought that my interesting it in dreams, and that I told my friends that in high school, ah, dreams are um, perfect. You can. It's like movie. Can we um, make some changes in it? Or I, and it's now I know it's because of narcolepsy. Then I thought I uh, kind of strange, uh, and all this situation in my life. Uh, it comes that, yeah, this must be narcolepsy. Uh, I, I started start to treat more and more and uh, communicate with people with Project Sleep. And yes, I'm sure it is uh, narcolepsy. And thanks this, now I am living. I'm a happy person. I can tell uh, everyone that, wait a minute, I need to sleep and it's okay. Uh, before driving car, I take a nap and I can drive this 10 minutes. It's okay. Mm, I'm no longer... Mm, irresponsible because if you don't know you can sleep you are fighting with this and if you are nar narcoleptic you know you it's it's not worth it with this fight you you will you will lose and when you know it you just take take your nap and you can function normally <laughs> normally uh, but um, all I, um, the most important thing i want to say it's problem in my country in poland with uh, doctors because after i knew it's narcolepsy I visited about 10 doctors and they told me, no, it's not narcolepsy. It's too rare to have it. It's not narcolepsy because you are not falling down. It's not narcolepsy because you can postpone uh, the sleep uh, about a few minutes, but the, their arguments were so, um, I, don't, I don't know what other words. It's, it was stupid and um, they're not educated. They're not, um, don't even um, want to interest it what I'm what I'm talking to them. It's um, when I said, please check my hormone. I don't have growth hormone. Uh, it's strange. I sleep uh, 18 hours per day. Can you look on my um, um, medical test? No, no, no. Please um, go home. And it's <clears throat> and I'm still waiting this five six months to have one visit with a specialized. A doctor specialized in uh, sleep medicine, and I'm still waiting. Um, 
uh, I started to um, to talk about it in Poland to to know uh, to get to know people that narcolepsy is a real disease. It exists. People are real. Uh, it's not like in movies. It's not only cataplexy. And um, and thanks to this, I found four girls, young girls in my country, who are also uh, like my w- were also in my situation. They have kids. They have no energy. They the it's different kind of uh, tiredness. It's not I'm tired because I was doing something. I'm tired because I wake up. And it's when you talk with these people, you know this is this kind of problem. And I I I ask them a few questions. Have you ever been in doctor? How many? And they say two, three, four times. And they're all m- misdiagnosed. And I and I ask another question. When last time you feel uh, that you are not tired? I don't remember. I don't know, uh, and, mm, and I can help them because now they know that narcolepsy exists, and they can make their test even if it took one year. But they can do it in day eight. They are 24, 22, 26. I'm 31, and my life was uh, you no know, was her- horrible. Uh, and that's why I'm in Project Sleep, and that's why I want to talk about it, and that's why I want to help uh, other. Uh, people and thank you guys you are all with me and i think in the world we can change this uh, that narcolepsy it's not only like (laughs) thank you oh agatha thank you so much for joining us i'm so glad that you joined because it's this reminder about that part of the journey um you know and agatha said you know i don't have a diagnosis officially yet so i don't know if i can be part of your broadcast and i said no i think you're in a situation that resonates with a lot of people um and uh we've all been there and um just uh, thank you for educating yourself um and thank you for uh and for advocating and working through this time and also going on TikTok and raising awareness on TikTok and finding other people. TikTok is, um, I'm 38, so it's like, it's, I, I can't do TikTok. I'm, it was I'm hard for I don't me too. <laughs> I don't know if they let 38 year olds be on TikTok, probably, but um, <laughs> it's not me. So, um, but I'm just so grateful for all you're doing um, and thank you for being such a strong voice. Um, and we're just so glad that you're here. And we hope for an update soon. Good update. <laughs> in a month. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, Lauren, I just want to check in with you and see if you wanted to share anything from uh, our viewers at this point. Yeah. So, <laughs> Agata, your, your story definitely resonated with a ton of people sharing you know, about their difficulties getting a diagnosis, being told, oh, you're young and healthy. You have, you know, go home and don't worry so much. Um, and also a lot of folks, you know, uh, just talking about the challenges of parenting with narcolepsy, wanting to hear more, um, Antia being interested in the coping strategies you developed over 30 years of having a narcolepsy diagnosis. So, um, tons of wonderful comments and, uh, just thanks everybody so much for, um, for all your wonderful, uh, participation. (laughs) It's great Mm -hmm. to see everyone. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so let us us go to Angola. And I'm so excited, Iris, because usually we get to talk when it's later in the day and it's like two in the morning or one in the morning yes. and you still tune in. You still tune into meetings um, with us because you are the most dedicated human I've ever met. Um, but it's kind of fun yes. to see you in daylight. <laughs> I know, see, I look better in the daylight, right? When I'm not in my pajamas. <laughs> It's nice to see you during the morning. Like, you know, you have to suffer now, not me. <laughs> I'm joking. So, so share with us about your experience. Oh, I almost forgot what I was doing here. Sorry. So, <laughs> so yeah. Um, well, yeah. So uh, like I said, I'm Iris from Angola. My experience is a little bit, I'm not going to say long because I think flus isn't, but it's definitely confusing. Um, so I think I've had my narcolepsy, I think, um, since I was 15. So my first initial hey, Iris? symptoms. Yeah. Iris, can you keep the camera kind of steady? Right oh, yeah, there? no. When it yeah, moves, yeah. It, you feel a little Wait, uh, that's seasick. Like, I'm going to have to like look from below up because, you know, phones. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, if it can just okay. be stable, that helps. 
Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. I've got my trusty. You turn it the other way. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Okay. Wait. Is that okay? No. <laughs> yes. Wait. Yeah, that's great. Got this it, is long it, as it stays in one place. One place. Wait. I got it. I got it. I got it. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Just getting my trusty um thing here to stay in one place. Sorry, guys. This is what I say, third world problems. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, as I was saying, um, so basically, I had cataplexy, and I think initially a lot of sleep paralysis, hallucinations at 15. And I didn't really start having my excessive daytime sleepiness until about the age of 21. And that's when I was in university and partying a little bit. And I just, had no clue. So basically I, I'm kind of like, um, I went about 12 years undiagnosed and I grew up in the UK, but I'm from Portugal and Angola. <laughs> but most of my life I did grow up in the UK. So at the time I was studying in the UK, but at the age of 24, I decided to come visit my sisters and I came to Angola for the first time. And that's when my symptoms just just got completely so much worse like from the very first day and obviously now I realize that the heat really really makes my symptoms so much worse so obviously living in a tropical country probably wasn't the best idea and I just started working full-time and literally from the very first day I just slept every single day at work and that was at the age of 24. <laughs> it wasn't until about the age of 28 that I got my diagnosis. And I'm still living in Angola. And I think it was just, obviously, I had two major uh, incidents that kind of helped me get diagnosed. So one of them, I was driving in my car and it was about 12 in the afternoon with, with my friends. And I literally just fell asleep. <laughs> and luckily, my friend was in the car because the wheel just started turning and you know it was really very dangerous and luckily there was nobody else you know on the right hand side of the car of those of the street otherwise could have been deadly and then two days later I went home and I was literally just trying to cook some food I sat down on the couch for about two seconds I think and then suddenly I woke up and I could smell burning and I was really confused. I thought it was the neighbor. I couldn't even remember what I was doing really. And that's when I kind of realized, okay, something is definitely not right. And it sounds so weird because you're 12 years with this and you think in 12 years, you didn't realize something was wrong. <laughs> Somehow, no. But yeah, and then I just started researching. I started researching, typing literally everything I could think into the internet, like why do I keep falling asleep at work? Why, why am I sleeping when I'm not tired? Somehow I got to the word narcolepsy. And unfortunately in Angola, we have zero, zero, I mean, zero awareness, zero medication, zero like medical support. We don't even have the ability to get diagnosed here. So obviously I'm very lucky. I have a family who was able to support me. So I flew to Portugal where my mom lives and luckily I was able to obviously pay privately because if you go public in Portugal it will probably take you a couple of years as well but going directly to a sleep clinic paying an absurd amount of money at least I got my diagnosis very quickly um, so I didn't really have to go through the doctors and the getting the wrong diagnosis luckily and then flew back to Angola <laughs> And literally, you know, I was lucky because in a way my doctor used to ship me the medicine, you know, so she used to, my mom used to buy it. So she used to get the prescription and my mom gets the medication, which is what I do now because I'm here again. And then somebody, we have to find somebody who's flying out because we can't send it through the post. It's not very reliable. And usually then I get the medication. So it's a little bit complicated, but we deal. Um, here... There really is nothing. There's, there's no options here. But I mean, I don't know how deep you want me to go into this. I mean, then I had a really bad experience, left Angola, went to the UK, went to Portugal, back to Angola. So, you know, uh, <laughs> but I think I'm okay now. And have you, yeah. have you met other people in Angola that 
so I guess if there's no way of getting diagnosed, then there's probably not a lot of other people with diagnosis. So you probably exactly. haven't met other people <laughs> with narcolepsy? No, no, I don't even think they know the words. <laughs> So, wow. You know, we have a long way to go, but it's a battle I'm willing to fight. And, you know, one step by step, we'll get there. <laughs> yep. Yep. I think I said about myself recently that um, uh, narcolepsy, you, you mess with the wrong girl about myself. But I'd say <laughs> Iris, Iris, probably the same um, narcolepsy mess with the wrong girl in Angola. <laughs> and uh, I will fight gonna... it in my sleep, you know, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think what you just said too, you said, why am I, was it you? I think that you said, why am I sleeping when I'm not even tired or something? <laughs> I, I, that was a really interesting observation. It's, a, it's um, <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Um, well, in the interest of time, Iris, I know um, people should also check out, Iris has shared her story in a broadcast with us um, on podcasts um, and uh, so many I'm different a bit tired of hearing it now, to be honest. Don't do it. <laughs> no. no, it's amazing. So um, check her out on social media as well. She put out a beautiful video today um, about different people's stories working with narcolepsy. Um, so incredible. Another opportunity to hear different stories from around the world. Um, so um, with that, why don't we go ahead and, and move to really quickly, we're going to take a flight uh, just in a few seconds from Angola to Brazil. And hear from Juliana. Hey, Juliana. Hey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me let me tell you about my symptoms. Actually, I don't know when it started because when I was a child, I had really scary and vivid nightmares um, almost every night, and. When I was a teenage, I started um, having interrupted night sleeps. I woke up every hour or every two hours and then fell asleep again. And it was weird. I even took a few tests when I was a teenage, but they, I think they weren't the right tests to detect uh, narcolepsy. So... I had to move on with my life. And when I was about 24 years old, I started feeling some dizziness. Um, they were not like uh, low blood pressure. Um, they felt different. And I start having hallucinations, hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations, a lot of them. I even thought that I was going crazy. Um, it was really weird and scared, but I'm lucky. I, I like to think I'm lucky because my mom has a narcolepsy diagnosis. So she detected some um, similar symptoms in me and she took me to a neurologist in Sao Paulo here in Brazil, in another city. And he diagnosed me when I was 24 um, with type two narcolepsy. And it was fine. Of course, I had to change my life, my routines, my, my everything, but I had a, a diagnosis. But a couple of years later, um, I started having cataplexy episodes and that was the, the, the worst part. I really didn't feel safe to do anything. I didn't know what was happening. And then I start um, Googling things about it. And that was when I realized that it was uh, related to the narcolepsy because my mom is actually in type two narcolepsy, narcoleptic and I start looking for a doctor because the doctor that diagnosed me was already retired. And um, after a lot of wrong doctors that said to me that I didn't have narcolepsy, that I had to do chemotherapy and treat my 
<laughs> yes, and treat my my disease some other ways. I finally find a neurologist here in Salvador that um, told me that I had cataplexy episodes and that my actual diagnosis was type one narcolepsy with cataplexy. So that was um, I was twenty six by then, and I started. Um, the process of finding the right medications to get me through it. Um, but I, as I said, I'm very lucky because my family was very understanding, most of all because my mom is a person with narcolepsy too. And my father maybe was scared. He tried to deny my symptoms, but most of my family and friends were very supportive. I have an amazing boyfriend. He is with me always. He he gave me he he gives me he gives me my meds every morning, and he is very comprehensive. When I say I'm not okay to go someplace, and he's amazing, actually amazing. So that's my reality but that's not um the truth for the majority of brazilian people with narcolepsy here we have no public support at all um we have actually in sao paulo a big center of narcolepsy that is really good it offers treatment and medication it's a reference in Latin America, but in other cities and other states, we have no public support. And some people have to um, spend more than $1,000 to get, uh, to have a diagnosis. And they cannot afford the medication. Um, some of them have to sue the, the government to, to have meds. And I think most of them um, spend their lives without meds. It's really hard. Um, our association, our Brazilian association, um, started in, 19, in, in 2019. So now we are trying to pass some bills to help people with narcolepsy because we we have known here and um, we have now some partnerships with some house hostels and we are helping some people to have their treatments but this is a um this is too little when we think about all the things we have to do here um, narcolepsy is not um, a disease, a, a condition that people know here. They don't know anything about it. It's re really rare to, to find someone who knows what is narcolepsy that really ever heard something about narcolepsy. So we are trying to step by step <laughs> make it better. And you're a big part of that by recently becoming a Rising Voices of Narcolepsy speaker. And uh, yes. we're so glad that you're going to be, um, you know, sharing your story. And you translated our slides into Portuguese. So we're very grateful for that. And can't wait to have you back to share your full story in English and in Portuguese. And Iris, too. We got to get you to do that as well in Portuguese. So. Um, uh, and thank you, big thanks to the Brazilian organization. Uh, I want to say Abrani is the acronym. Yes, uh, they, Abrani, yes. They are a force of nature that have just um, exploded on social media. They are, um, their passion and advocacy is just so cool and gives me so much hope. Um, Juliana, like you said, you know, there's a lot, there's a long way to go. Um, but um, I think with the energy and enthusiasm, um, and well, I know our energy is all limited, <laughs> but um, with the passion of this group, I think that we're gonna see a lot of change in Brazil. Um, 
Yes, so. I'm very proud of them. Um, the Abrani is very, um, it's an actual hope of changing here. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so I know we're, we're over the hour. If anyone needs to hop off, I understand. I do want to share um, a really uh, special piece of artwork from Dana, who is in Israel. And uh, Dana and I have been in touch for many years. Um, she's touched my heart for, for many years, actually. Um, and, and she made a special, she didn't want to necessarily join us live um, because of worrying about English language, but um, she made a very special artwork just for the broadcast today. So um, I'm really excited to share this with you and share a little bit about her story with you from Israel. Um, <clears throat> so, Dana made this beautiful artwork. Hopefully you can see it. And I'm gonna go ahead and share first a little bit about her and, and then a little bit of, well, um, I guess I'll share about the artwork first. Uh, so Dana writes, I chose to make a work re related to both types of narcolepsy, type one and type two. On the right, uh, narcolepsy showed as with boredom and the complex relationship of sleep and wakefulness. And on the left, cataplexy and other symptoms are related to REM, the cheerful, happy, excited, and colorful side. She writes, the two are close to each other. The right always exists. The left sometimes joins. And then she writes about the right side. The man is a silhouette in the dark with circuits all over his body. The dream falls apart. The puzzle pieces don't fit together anymore. The proper connection between sleep and wakefulness has been lost. The man is handcuffed. He feels blind. In between, the rain doesn't stop. The umbrella is already in tears, and a ghost is sitting on his shoulder, doesn't want to leave. Some bright stars and moon give some light, and in some, and in some of the cracks are written the symptoms that characterize his disorder. On the left, a little happy girl enjoys her life. She is climbing high, laughing, playing without fear, gives free rein to her emotions, ignores demons and all the warning signs that warn her from, from all over. Watch out, little girl. You are playing roulette. She knows she is taking a risk that all the joy and laughter and emotion can in one moment make the whole celebration end. And I thought it was really powerful here that she put the words, I thought I heard you laughing. Uh, so it's yeah, just- I was thinking about the REM song, Losing My Religion. I thought that I heard you laughing. It was just coming to my ear. And I think it's really beautiful because and laughing I, I is also dangerous for us sometimes, but sorry for interrupting. No, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, so I just want to share a little bit about Dana. Her first symptom started at the age of 18, maybe a little bit earlier. I was already just, uh, starting to feel daily drowsy on some level. I needed at least one nap a day. And she was diagnosed at age 34. At least 10 years after I realized I had a significant problem. Previously, I could, I could uh, feel less symptoms because the lifestyle allowed me to. Uh, but I was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, um, and I and she worked and she learned from home and she was able to sleep during the day without interruption and worked a few hours per week, especially from home. Uh, and she was diagnosed at 34 with type one narcolepsy, and this is supposedly my luck. Otherwise, I probably would not have received the diagnosis until now. Um, I'm imagining maybe because of the cataplexy. Um, I asked her about her family and friends support. She says, this is a difficult question. I want to believe that they understand and also generally support, but never will anyone be able to understand what I'm dealing with. Only someone who lives close to me can probably understand even the difference between being very tired and being sleepy. Sometimes it seems to the environment that if I take my medication, the problem should no longer exist. Despite the diagnosis, everyone is tired. I know that it is very difficult for them to see me in different situations and that they uh, take it very hard sometimes. 
And then I asked her about awareness in Israel. She said, in Israel, narcolepsy is a rare disease that has hardly been heard of, even doctors, even neurologists. In, mo in most cases are type one, uh, no, sorry, type two. Type one is very rare. There are, e uh, there are very few sleep doctors in Israel and it takes years to get a correct diagnosis. Uh, she says she's lucky because thanks to a colleague who worked at a sleep lab among excellent sleep doctors and suspected that she had narcolepsy, uh, she was able to go to that doctor and get diagnosis and treatment. There is no specific specialist for narcolepsy uh, and only last year the first drug for narcolepsy was approved and entered the market, which was Wakex. Despite this, um, she is also receiving sodium oxabate with delivery directly to Israel free of charge. Uh, she and only two or, other, two or three other children uh, from the whole country are, are currently on sodium oxabate. I remember her telling me that she was the second person ever in Israel that was on sodium oxabate. Um, and right now her symptoms, the most challenging one is mostly brain fog, inability to stay awake in the evening and um, hot weather. <laughs> so a shout out to hot weather, Iris, um, is a trigger for her sleep attacks. And so in recent months, she's barely left the house. Israel is a very hot country and she um, would like to live in Europe, I think is what she says. Uh, one of the most difficult challenges is being a mother of two children uh, during the Corona period uh, when they are not regularly in school and my daily routine can be disrupted. I think I've been really, relatively balanced lately since I left work and I'm uh, barely out of the house. It was very difficult for me to get my previous job. The travel was difficult. Sometimes I had a hard time being alert and focused even at 11 in the morning or being at work on time. And my direct manager sometimes treated me like a person without motivation. He said he would bring me back to work when I agreed to uh, stay for staff meetings at noon. Um, and she's hoping she, she got her World Narcolepsy Day t-shirt and she hopes it will arrive by next month. <laughs> and we really hope so. So I'm really grateful for Dana for sharing her beautiful artwork uh, with us today. I know she worked really hard on this, especially for this for this. Uh, and so we will post this on our socials as well. Um, and thank you to Dana for sharing this. Um, gosh, guys, this has been incredible. Does anyone have any last thoughts um, that they want to share before we sign off? Because I know it's we've um, or maybe we should check in with Lauren and see uh, what people are saying online. Sure. Yeah. Um... So, you know, tons more great comments. Um, uh, so folks are showing a lot of Brazilian pride <laughs> um, and uh, grateful to Juliana and Iris for translating our um, Rising Voices slides into Portuguese so that we can share with audiences in Brazil and Portugal. Um, so thank you again for that amazing work. Um, anybody who's ever met Iris knows that she is a force um, and folks are saying you're just the right person for the job, uh, raising awareness there in Angola. Um, also talking about, you know, recognizing the challenges of getting a diagnosis in um, places that have a, you know, public health care system. Um, and the, the extreme rarity, I guess, of diagnosis in Brazil. And also just having tons of love for Dana's amazing artwork. And uh, somebody actually asked if they could get a print. <laughs> So um, just so much love from all over the world and so grateful for everybody online being here with us. Well, thank you, Lauren. Anyone have any last thoughts or um, I think I was going to say, how are you going to celebrate World Narcolepsy Day? Besides this, I think um, Brad's probably going to head to sleep, I hope soon. <laughs> It is quarter past midnight, so I'm going to uh, head off to sleep. It is uh, just past World Narcolepsy <laughs> Day for me, but I, and I <laughs> hope everybody else has an amazing day. So <laughs> thank you so much for thank having me. And, um, I haven't fallen asleep yeah. yet. So <laughs> yes, I know. Well, we're very grateful. You're, you're at the that late end. I'm at the early end. So um, thank you again for being here from Australia. Um, any last uh, thoughts from anybody else around the world? We're going to, Antia, we're going to have you back for the parenting broadcast. Don't you worry. <laughs> oh yeah. I was actually thinking about, um, we can also talk about um, translating or being an advocate if that's, if you don't have one already in Germany. So Yes, yes, we don't. I, I, we have our materials in, a, in eight different languages now, but not in German. So 
I will sign you up for that. Need, um, happy to learn more about it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, why don't we go ahead and say uh, goodbye for now because this has been a wonderful, wonderful discussion. And I am just so grateful to all of you for taking this time and sharing so openly um, on a topic that, you know, um, isn't something we maybe talk about every single day. So, um, or in English. <laughs> so, um, big hearts and lots of love. And thank you, David, for joining us from China um, and sharing. And we're so glad to have Narcolepsy China organization as part of this effort. Um, and I know that you guys have a big forum coming up in a few days on this weekend. So um, I hope the forum goes well um, and just keep connecting with each other around the world, guys, and have a great World Narcolepsy Day. Um, I'll be back in a few hours um, with a Instagram live with um, Josh Andrews, our NFL player living with narcolepsy. So join us on IG live to ask him some questions about his experience and um, have a great day, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.